Hi guys, welcome to my all-in-one AQA new spec physics video. Just to remind you that I do do an accompanying revision guide. It's a PDF with all three sciences and it's for triple students. And if you want to get hold of a copy, then you need to email me sciencewithhazel at gmail.com and that costs three pounds. It's not a direct transcript of everything I'm saying, but it's incredibly similar because it just comes out of my brain and um, it tends to come out very similarly each time. Anyway, enough gabbling, let's get started. Eight, a train travels from town A to town B. Figure 14 shows the route taken by the train. Figure 14 has been drawn to scale. So we've got town A, bit of a convoluted route to town B, and we've been given a scale. The distance the train travels between A and B is not the same as the displacement of the train. What is the difference between dis dis distance and displacement? That's all to do with whether they're vector or scalar quantities. Remember, scalar only has a magnitude, whereas a vector quantity has a magnitude and a direction. So you just need to point out which is which. You're going to say that distance is a scalar quantity, whereas displacement is a vector quantity. Use figure 14 to determine the displacement of the train in travelling from A to B. Show how you obtain your answer. So we need our answer in kilometres, and we need a direction. So pop your ruler and use a sharp pencil and you need to draw a straight line linking town A to town B. Measure the length of that and you should get a value which is approximately 7.4 centimetres and then because we need it in kilometres you're going to do 7.4 times 5 because we're using the scale to help us. So do 7.4 times 5 and that will give you a value which is 37 kilometres. And then lastly you have to measure the direction, so draw a north line, it's like a bearing here, and use your protractor to measure this angle here, and if you've drawn it nice and accurately you should get an answer that lies between 60 and 64 degrees. Right, so first of all to understand the difference between weight and mass we need to get to the grips with the word force, because weight is an example of a force whereas mass isn't. So what is a force? Well a force is a push or a pull and we might not be able to see forces necessarily but we can see the effect that they have on objects. So a force may cause an object to speed up, it might cause it to change direction or it might even change its shape. So force is a strange thing because remember you can't always see it but you can see its effect. You can measure the size of a force using a force meter and remember that the units are always in newtons. And because I told you just now that weight is an example of a force the units of weight is also newtons. Mass is measured in kilograms. So when people talk about weighing themselves on a set of weighing scales, they're really talking about calculating their mass, which is again why it's so confusing. So when you pop yourself on the weighing scales, you'll see that your mass is, I don't know, 60 kilograms. Um, and that's not your weight, that's your mass. And your mass is a measure of how much matter there is inside of you. So it doesn't matter where you go, what planet you're stood on, your mass will always be the same. However, because weight depends on gravity, and gravity varies, you'll see a difference in your weight in different places. So, for example, if you have an astronaut that has a mass of about 120 kilograms, remember that his mass on the Earth and on the Moon will be the same, because mass stays the same. However, his weight will drastically vary, because on the Earth, he will have a weight of 1,200 newtons, but because the gravity is so much less on the Moon, his weight will only about, be about 200 newtons. Let's quickly summarise. Remember, a force is something which is either a push or a pull, and it causes an object to speed up, change direction, or change its shape. Now, remember that force is measured in newtons, and that you often see a force diagram, and that's basically an object which is moving, and it will have arrows, and the size of the arrow represents how large the force is. So obviously the larger the arrow, the larger the force. Remember in um, your textbook I'll often talk about balanced forces. That is when two forces acting on an object, they'll be acting in opposite directions to each other. And remember that they have to be the same size for them to be balanced forces. And that basically means that an object which is standing still, i.e. stationary, it won't speed up, it will stay exactly as it is. And it also means that an object which is travelling at a certain speed, when it has balanced forces acting on it, 
will continue to travel at that speed. It won't speed up, it won't slow down. So therefore, if we're talking about unbalanced forces, it makes sense that one of the forces opposing the other force is larger than the other. So if the object is stationary, it will start moving, and if the object is travelling at certain speed, it will either speed up or slow down. So, what are these forces that we're talking about? I'm going to use the example of a car driving along the street to help illustrate this. So, you have a car, it's sat on the tarmac and it's driving. So the forward force is going to be the driving force from the engine. And that will be causing the car to either accelerate or just carry on travelling at the same speed. Opposing that driving force will be several other forces. First of all, air resistance, otherwise known as drag. Now, what is that? Basically, if you've got a car moving, you've got air whistling past it, and these air particles, they'll collide with the car and they generate a tiny, tiny force which acts in the opposite direction to the direction the car's travelling. And by doing that, they oppose the motion of the car, so they act to slow it down. And we have lots of other forces opposing motion, so there's friction. Remember, friction is the force that occurs between surfaces, so the friction in this example will be between the car wheels and the road. So remember, it's that friction which is useful because it allow, allows the car to grip onto the road and in certain conditions, like icy conditions, wet conditions, or if the tyres have been too worn, you'll decrease the friction between the tyres and the road and that can lead to dangerous occurrences like the car skidding. So a bit of friction is important. You have other forces acting on the car. You have weight. Remember, that's the downward force due to gravity. And don't forget this force. It's called the normal reaction. And that occurs between the tyres and the road surface, and it occurs upwards, so perpendicular to the road. And basically, all the normal reaction is, is it's the force which stops objects kind of being forced into the earth, so it acts against gravity. That's quite a hard one to imagine, but just remember that it occurs at 90 degrees to the surface. Remember, when we talk about terminal velocity, we tend to use the example of a parachutist jumping out of an aeroplane, and you'll often see lots of diagrams of arrows of different sizes. I'm going to try and talk to you about that now. So, let's start at the top. We're starting in our aeroplane, and our parachutist is looking out, and he's about to jump. The moment he jumps, the only force acting on him is weight. So that will cause him to accelerate towards the Earth's surface. Now, the faster he accelerates, the, the bigger the air resistance, because remember, as he's dropping, he's going to be hitting lots of air, and that, those air particles are going to be acting in the opposite direction to his motion, trying to slow him down. And the faster he travels, the more particles will be hitting per second. So the overall force of drag, or air resistance, will become very large. So at a certain point, you will find that the size of the air resistance, or the drag, will match the, the size of the weight force acting downwards, and we call that terminal velocity because all that means is that the two forces are balanced and the parachutist will no longer accelerate, he'll just continue falling at a constant speed. And that is what terminal velocity is basically, neither accelerating or decelerating, just travelling at a constant speed. Before too long, the parachutist will choose to open his parachute because he won't obviously want to splatter on the ground. When he opens his parachute, you see a massive increase in the surface area of the parachutist and therefore way more air particles will be, will be trapped inside the parachute and therefore air resistance will inc increase hugely and he'll jerk upwards as a result of that and you'll see that he'll slow down. However, because his speed decreases, that actually causes air resistance to decrease because if you think about it, the slower he now travels, the fewer air particles will be hitting him and opposing his motion and therefore he'll slow down. And eventually his weight and the size of the drag air resistance force will become the same and we call that terminal velocity again because he's now travelling at a constant speed. Now remember that terminal velocity will be at a much lower speed than the initial one and that's due to the fact he's opened up his parachute. Remember if an object gains momentum it just means that it becomes increasingly difficult to slow down or to change its direction. Momentum is a vector quantity, which means it has a magnitude and a direction. Remember, that's different from being a scalar quantity, which has magnitude only. It's important that you're clear on the conservation of momentum in explosions and collisions. 
Remember that as long as there are no external forces at play, the total momentum in an explosion or collision remains the same. And what that basically means is that the momentum before the explosion or the collision is the same as the momentum after. And we use that in a mathematical setting. We simply say that momentum before equals momentum after. So if we have two objects, we can work out their momentum before individually. So by doing the calculation, which is their mass times their velocity, and you add those two together, and then you can make it equal their momentum after afterwards and generally questions will say that the objects stuck together um, and in that case you can just add the masses together and times them by their velocity. I realise this is sounding really complicated so I think I'm just going to quit there and show you my maths and I think that will sort things out. A truck of mass 500 kilograms moving at 4 meters per second to the right collides with another truck of mass 1500 kilograms moving at 1.5 meters a second to the left. What is their common velocity after the collision if they stick together? I think the best thing here is to do a little diagram so you can see what's going on. So the first lorry is going 4 metres per second to the right and has a mass of 500 kilograms. So I've written that there. Our other lorry is going left, so I'm going to draw an arrow showing that. And its speed was 1.5 metres per second. And its mass is 1,500 kilograms. So let's work out their individual momentums. So I'm just going to write that here. So the top lorry is going to be 4 times 500, which is 2,000 kilograms meters per second. And the one at the bottom is 1.5 times 1,500, and that's going to give us 2,250, so 2,250 kilograms meters per second. The crucial thing here is that they are moving in different directions. So when we try and add up their momentums before, we need to basically take the biggest number. It doesn't matter which way around you do it, but I'm going to take the biggest number. And then I'm going to... Because you have to add the two momentums together, but the point is the other lorry's moving in the other direction. So I'm actually going to have to take it away. I hope that makes sense. And then, bearing in mind what the other equation was doing, remember we now need to look at the momentum afterwards. And we do that by adding the two masses together and timesing it by their common velocity. So we're looking for their common velocity, so I'm going to call that x. What is their two masses? Well, that's going to be 500 plus 1500 to give us 2000. Okay, now it's just a matter of sorting out our numbers. So that's 250 equals 2000x. Divide both sides by 2000 and you'll get 0 0.125 meters per second. Cool, and because it is a velocity, we're going to say that that is moving to the left because we need a direction. Okay, question four. Emma is standing still and fires a rifle. The bullet has a mass of 0 0.045 kilograms and is traveling at 350 meters per second. If Emma has a mass of 60 kilograms, with what velocity does she move backwards? Okay, so again, we're using this equation as always. Momentum before equals momentum afterwards. Okay, the crucial thing here is that Emma is standing still and that tells us that, therefore, the momentum before has to be zero because she's not moving. So that's quite straightforward. Let's look at the momentum afterwards. Well, it's going to be the momentum of the bullet plus the momentum of Emma. So the momentum of the bullet is 0 0.05 times 350. And then we're going to add that to Emma's momentum. And her mass is 60, and we need to times that by her velocity which we're actually trying to find, so I'm going to call that x. Now we just have to make everything equal each other, so the momentum before equals the momentum after, so 0 equals, and then that calculation here is 15.75 plus 60x. Right, we need to take away the 15.75 from both sides to give us this number, minus 15.75 equals 60x, and then divide both sides by 60 to get x by itself, and we get the number minus 0 0.263 meters per second. And that makes sense that her velocity should be in the opposite direction to the bullet because obviously the bullet goes out forwards and you end up recoiling backwards because of just how guns work, basically. So yay, that's that question done. I'm so slow at this bit, I'm so sorry. Okay. A car of mass 1,000 kilograms travelling at a velocity of 20 metres per second collided with a stationary car of mass 1,000 kilograms. The vehicles moved together after the impact calculate their velocity. This is kind of, I think, really similar to the sort of thing you might be asked in the exam. And if you follow these steps, then we promise you'll always get it right. As always, momentum before equals momentum after. So let's look at the before. So it's the 
first cast, that's a thousand times twenty because that's mass times velocity, plus the veloc velocity times the mass of the second car. But the crucial thing here is that the car is stationary, so it's obviously going to be a thousand times zero, and obviously anything times by zero is zero. So the momentum before is therefore twenty thousand. Okay, let's look at the momentum after. So they're stuck together, so we need to add their two masses together and times it by their common velocity. So we're looking for their velocity, so it's going to be 2000x. And therefore, 20,000 equals 2000x. We need to divide both sides by 2000 in order to get x equals 10 meters per second. Nice. Cool. So we're nearly there. Now let's talk about moments. Remember a moment is a turning effect, so it's about turning something and it's given by the equation force times perpendicular distance from the pivot. So we see examples with seesaws, for example, when the sun was sat on each end and the further away they are from the middle, which is the pivot, the greater turning effect they'll produce. Now, for example, if you're trying to close the door, it's much easier to close the door with your little finger if you're very far away from the hinge. Try it yourself if you don't believe me. It's really straightforward. You don't need to add a lot of force. And that's because the perpendicular distance from the edge of the door to the hinge is very long. However, if you try and do the same experiment but very close to the hinge, then because you're so close to the pivot, the hinge, it's going to require a lot more force and you'll find it far more difficult. And we use that every day in scissors, for example. You've got the pivot where the blade's attached the length of the blades will actually help you create a nice turning effect and help you cut stuff. Figure 21 shows how small weight placed on the insulating bar makes the y-x go back and balance in its original position. The y-x is 5 centimetres long and carries a current of 1.5 amps. The small weight causes a clockwise moment of 4.8 times 10 to the minus 4 newton metres. Calculate the magnetic flux density where y-x is positioned. Give the unit First of all, it is essential that you have everything in the correct units. So we got told that that was eight centimeters. We need to convert that to um, meters. So just do eight divided by 100 to do that, which gives you 0 0.08 meters. We've been told the moment, so we need to work out the force. So moment equals force times distance. We know the moment is 4.8 times 10 to the minus four. So we know that equals F times 0 0.08, which I've just worked out. So to find F, you're going to do 4.8 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 0 0.08. And that gives a force, which is 6 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. The reason why we need this is we're now going to pluck that equation out that we need to work out that magnetic flux, so that's going to be force equals magnetic flux density, I'm going to write it like this otherwise I'll run out of space, times current, which is given by I, times length. So I've just worked out the forces 6 times 10 to the minus 3. We're looking for the magnetic flux, so I'm going to put an X there. We've got the current, which we've been told is 1.5 amps. And lastly, we got told that the wire is 5 centimetres long, so I'm going to convert that to metres again by dividing by 100 to get 0 0.05. Let's just cancel some of this down. So 6 times 10 to the minus 3 equals 0 0.05 times 1.5, which is 0 0.075X. To get x by itself, you need to divide both sides by 0 0.075. So that is 6 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 0 0.075, which gives you a value of 0 0.08. And the unit for magnetic flux, flux density is the Tesla, or capital T. We also use moments in gears, and this is when it gets slightly more complicated. So just remember, when we're talking about gears, we're talking about cogs, and that you have a large cog and a small cog, doesn't matter which way around we do it at the moment, but they attach to each other, one spins and it turns the other one, and that's actually what's happening when we change gear, either in a car or on a bike. Now, if you just start with a small cog, and you attach it to a big one, as in my diagram here, 
Do you see that as the small cog completes an entire rotation, it will only spun a tiny bit of the large cog, probably about a quarter of that cog, and it will have spun it quite slowly. So we see that when you've got a small cog going to a big cog, and we call that turning into a higher gear, you're gonna see that the speed is gonna slow down, but you're gonna generate a lot of turning effect. If we take the opposite argument, and this time we start with a large cog, and we make it attach to a small cog, then clearly as the large cog turns, it's gonna cause the small cog to turn pretty much an entire, revol entire revolution. So that will be spinning the small cog nice and quickly, so we've generated high speed, but we won't have generated a lot of power, and therefore the turning effect will be low. If we take a real life example, let's look at cars. Now to start a car, you need low speed and you need a high turning effect. And that's why we start in a low gear, which is gear one. And that's because what you need here is you need a small gear turning into a larger cog. So a small cog turning into a larger cog. So it's turning slowly, but it's generating a lot of driving force, a lot of turning effect. At higher speeds, when you're rampaging on the motorway at 80 miles an hour, you just need high speed. You don't need an awful lot of turning effect because the engine's already got itself to that speed. So this time, you're going to have a large cog attached to a small cog so that when the large cog turns, it's going to have ensured that that small cog's turned quite a lot. It's turned nice and quickly, hence driven, hence producing a large amount of speed. So to summarise, a low gear gives a low speed and a high turning effect. A high gear gives a high speed and a low turning effect. If this is sounding absolutely impossible, because it is, just try and learn the notes I'm gonna um, add now and just learn them off by heart and we'll do some calculations now and make sure you can do that part of the gear topic. A gear wheel of radius 30 millimeters is used to turn another gear wheel of radius 10 millimeters with a force of 60 newtons. Calculate the moment of the force on A, the 10mm wheel, and B, the 30mm wheel. So the crucial thing here is to use your equation for calculating moments. So state it, which is moment equals force times perpendicular distance from pivot. And my handwriting is as legible as normal. Now the crucial thing here is to realise that the radius of the gear wheel is the same as the perpendicular distance from the pivot so you're literally allowed to substitute those values in for each other and that makes it quite, quite straightforward so for moment for the 10 millimeter wheel you're just going to write moment equals force which is given as 60 newtons times the wheel radius and remember our SI unit for distance is in meters so you just need to convert 10 millimeters to meters and that gives you a value which is 0 0.010 meters. Pop that into your calculator and you'll get a value which is 0 0.60 newton meters. Let's do the moment around B. So moment equals 60 times, this time we've got 0 0.030 meters when we convert 30 millimeters to meters. Pop that into your calculator and you'll get a value which is 1.80 newton meters. Time for some moment questions. The diagram shows the apparatus used to investigate moments. The two newton weight is placed 60 centimeters from the pivot. The newton meter is placed 10 centimeters from the pivot. State the equation linking moment force and perpendicular distance from the pivot. Right, moment equals force times perpendicular distance. Remember the units, moments are measured in newton meters, force is measured in newtons, and perpendicular distance is measured in meters. Two, calculate the reading on the newton meter, ignore the weight of the ruler. Okay, don't stress here, we can work this out. Remember the law, which is that clockwise moment equals anti-clockwise moment. So let's look at the clockwise moment. So We've been told that it, the weight is 60 centimetres from the pivot. The moment, therefore, clockwise will be 0 0.6 because you need to convert from centimetres into metres times 2. And now we need to look at the anti-clockwise moment. I can see that this newton metre is at 10 centimetres. So it's just a matter of substituting them all into the equation and finding the missing value. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So let's just do clockwise equals anti-clockwise. Please don't run out of space, Hazel. 
So clockwise was 2 newtons times the distance, which I said was 0 0.6. We've just seen that the newton meter is 10 centimeters away from the stand, so that's 0 0.1. And we're looking for the weight of the ruler, which is the same as the force, so I'm going to write x here. And now we just need to solve 1.2 equals 0 0.1. 1x, therefore x equals 12 newtons. Now, a resultant force is quite hard to define because there can be lots of forces acting on an object and a resultant force is kind of the combined effect of all those forces. In terms of the definition you'll need to provide, it is a resultant force is a single force that has the effect of all of the forces acting on an object. In terms of maths and the video we're going to look at now, I'm going to show you how you can work out the resultant force when you've been given several different types of questions. Now the issue with the questions isn't actually the maths involved because actually all you need is a protractor, make sure you have one of those, and a ruler and a sharp pencil. Make sure you use a pencil in case you screw up so you can rub it out because if you're using pen you're going to get into quite a mess. And then it's a matter of counting distances, counting the length along your ruler rather than actually using trigonometry to help you solve it. So I promise it's not as hard as it looks. I'm going to show you some examples now. One, figures six and seven show examples where two forces act on an object x. In each case, work out the magnitude and direction of the resultant force on x. Now, don't go straight into drawing a parallelogram of forces because you've learned that and therefore you're determined to use it. Sometimes you won't need to use it and it won't make sense to. Just look at the figure closely to work out what's going on. So you can see that this guy is pulling on a pulley and he's pulling with a force of 350 newtons. But the crucial thing is that pulley is attached to here, which means his force is actually pulling this weight upwards. Now the weight of the box is pulling the box down by 300 newtons. So what's the difference in those two numbers? Well, it's 50 newtons, and obviously that will be up. So your answer is 50 newtons upwards. Then we've got two men pushing a trolley that's quite a heavy weight up a hill and so one of them is pulling it. But you can see from these force arrows that they're both pulling in the same direction. So all you have to do here is add together the individual forces. So that's 300 plus 200, and that's a 500 Newton force up the hill. And that's done. Now I'm gonna show you how, when to use the parallelogram of forces. So a force of three Newtons and a force of four Newtons act on a point. Determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant of these two forces if the angle between their line of action is. And I probably should have mentioned it before, but magnitude is literally just the size of the force, so the calculation that we literally just did. So in order to do this, you will need your ruler, and you'll need to choose a sensible scale. So I'm going to choose one centimetre to represent one newton. It doesn't matter which way around you do this, but I'm going to do my three newtons along here. So that's going to be a three centimetre long line. I'm using a pen, by the way, because obviously I'm not answering an exam paper, so it doesn't actually matter if I screw up here. And then you're using your protractor because you want a perfect 90 degree angle to mark where 90 degrees is, which is here. And now you've got your two points. You want to link that together with a, oh, that's annoying. It's not actually as long as I want it to be, but I'm fairly sure I've drawn that nice and accurately. So that's a four centimeter line going upwards. And now we're gonna turn it into a parallelogram going to label my forces. So what is a parallelogram? Well it's a shape that has two parallel sides. So obviously parallel to three newtons will be this line. And then parallel to this line we're going to draw four centimeters coming down. Okay, so we've completed our parallelogram, which in this case is just a rectangle. And then in order to find the resultant force, all you have to do is join the corner of that parallelogram to where the forces originated from. So we're just going to draw a nice straight line. You must use a ruler for this. And then in terms of working out the magnitude, just measure the length of that line. Yeah, and that's 5. So your resultant force is 5 newtons. And then in terms of working out the direction, you're just going to measure this angle here. And then make sure you're reading the right way. So obviously you're reading in this case this way. I think I've done it slightly wonkily, so I'm going to put that as 55 degrees. And that's how I've worked out both the magnitude and direction. Let's do example B. So the same question, a force of 3 newtons and 4 newtons, but this time with a 60 degree angle between them. 
There's my three Newton force again. I'm going to use the protractor to draw, make sure you're using it nice and accurately. Align it 60 degrees. And then we're going to join that up again. And there's the four Newtons. So let's draw the parallelogram. I'm going to use the protractor to help me improve the accuracy this time. So we're drawing the parallel line that runs against that one, so it's going to run in this angle, but I'm just going to use that to center it. And we can see this is going to form a nice parallel line. And then it should be straightforward enough to just link these and they should be, it should be three centimetres long, which it is, so that's nice. Perfect. And now to work out the resultant force, simply join. Measure the length of this line. There will be error margins, guys, so don't worry too much. That's 6.2 centimetres, that's 6.2 newtons. And then measure this angle here to work out the direction. It's 33 degrees. Okay, slightly more tricky question, and it's simply because of the way they've written it rather than the actual maths. A tow rope is attached to a car at 2.0.8 metres apart. The two sections of rope joined to the car are the same length and are at 30 degrees to each other. The pull on each attachment should not exceed 3,000 newtons. Use the parallelogram of forces to determine the maximum tension in the main tow rope. The way you want to start with this is by giving yourself a rough sketch of what's going on. So I do apologise, I can't draw. So there's the end of my car with the light. And I've been told that it's a tow rope which is joining the car at two points, which is 0.8 meters apart and then we know that there's two of them and that they join with an angle of 30 degrees so that's the way the resultant force will be acting so now we've got our idea of what's going on in setup we can now start to draw the parallelogram of forces and that's going to be formed from these two lines here the second thing to note is it says that the pull on each attachment should not exceed 3000 newtons so that's talking about here. And if I use 1,000 newtons to be represented by one centimetre, that will mean that we have three centimetre length there, three centimetre length there. So we're ready to go. So I'm going to draw three centimetres, it doesn't matter what angle at the moment, here. That's going to represent my 3,000 newtons. It is good, by the way, to draw a scale, so one centimetre equals 1,000 newtons. Then we're going to use the protractor to measure 30 degrees. And we'll join up those lines, making sure that it's only a three centimetre length line. Great. There's the next one. There's 30 degrees. And I'll turn it into a parallelogram. Just make sure that it is parallel, because sometimes it's quite confusing with using protractors, but just make sure the two lines do go in the same direction. So I know that has to be here. Let's draw another three centimetre line. Which means I can just join this up, so I've now got my parallelogram sorted, and good, that's three centimetres long. And then because we're looking for the resultant force, you're just finding the length of this line in here. Just to touch on the resolution of forces topic, now we've just done the parallelogram of forces, it's very very similar and luckily you don't need to do too much, you just need to use your ruler and your protractor. So for example, they could give you something sitting on a slope or a hill and they could tell you the angle of that slope. So what you're going to do is you'll be given an object and you'll be told its weight. Now, based on where it is on the slope, you can draw a line straight down the slope 
and then use your protractor to draw a line 90 degrees to the object. So you'll end up with a right angle at the object. And if you bring that weight line down, you're going to be able to draw another parallelogram. And then in order to resolve the forces, if they ask you to work out the horizontal force, you're just going to measure it using your ruler. And if they ask you for the vertical force, you're going to measure the line coming down. Um, I think I'll show you on my iPad because this is sounding hard. A student pushed a trolley of weight 510 newtons up a slope that is inclined at 20 degrees to the horizontal. Determine the component of the trolley's weight parallel and perpendicular to the slope. So I'm just going to show you how you go about answering this. You're going to need a sharp pencil, probably a rubber, definitely a ruler and a protractor. So you're going to start by drawing your slope. Use your protractor to measure 20 degrees here. And then you're going to pop a little block on it which will show you your trolley. Now we've been told the weight of the trolley is 510 newtons and because we're drawing a scale diagram I'm therefore going to make the line 5.1 centimetres long so your usual ruler to measure a line which is exactly 5.1 centimetres long and that's your 510 newton weight. Now because we use the parallel parallelogram of forces to help you answer this you then need to draw a line which is parallel so down here using your ruler and then perpendicular, so that means at 90 degrees. So use your protractor to make sure that this angle here is 90 degrees. And because it's a parallelogram of forces, you need to bring that down here and then make it into a parallelogram. See, this is why it's so horrible to draw on the iPad, like this. And because you've drawn it all to scale, that will therefore enable you to work out the various components. So use your ruler, first of all, to measure the length of this line. And let's just pretend that it is... 2.1 centimetres long, so that's the parallel component. And then use your ruler again to measure the length of this line, which is your perpendicular component, and I'm going to say that that was 3.5 centimetres long. Then we need to use ratios to actually work out the forces rather than having it in centimetres. So you know that 510 newtons equals 5.1 centimetres so divide both sides by 5.1 to get what 1 centimetre would be. So we know that 1 centimetre gives you 100 newtons. And therefore it's just a matter of substituting this in. So to work out this perpendicular component, just do 3.5 times 100 to get 350 newtons as the perpendicular component. And then for the parallel component, do 2.1 times 100 to get 210 newtons as the parallel component. 9.6. By measuring the length of the skid marks, an, an accident investigator determines that the distance a car travelled between the brakes being applied and stopping was 22 metres. The investigator used a sled to determine the friction. The investigator then calculated that the car decelerated at 7.2 metres per second squared. Calculate the speed of the car just before the brakes were applied. Give your answer to two sig fig. Okay, so this is SUVAT, so we're using this equation, which is V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. Now it's just a matter of identifying what everything is. So the distance here is S. The acceleration is, well, it's minus 7.2, but that's the acceleration. So that's A. We're looking at the speed of the car just before the brakes were applied. So we're looking for the initial speed, which is U so that's a question mark, and we know that it stopped, so that means the final speed was zero. So just substitute in all these values. So it's literally zero squared, which is zero, equals u squared plus two times minus 7.2 times the distance, which was 22. So zero equals u squared minus 7.2. Three hundred and sixteen point eight. How do we get u squared by itself? Well, add it to both sides. So three hundred sixteen point eight equals u squared, and then square root that answer in order to calculate your u. So u will equal eighteen to two significant figures. I've just double checked the physics equation sheet um, because I actually knew this equation off the top of my head, so I didn't use it. But they've given it in a slightly different form, and I just want you to see that it does work. It doesn't matter which way around you do it. It does work. So v squared, squared again is 0. Minus u squared is what we're looking for. Equals 2 times the acceleration, which was minus 7.2, times the distance, which was 22. And then if you pop that into your um, calculator, you get a value which is 
Well, they will be the same, won't it? It'll be 316.8 minus, and then because they're both minus, you can get rid of the minus and then square root it and you'll get 18 again, so it does work either way. Here's your bread and butter where this topic's concerned. You really need to know these equations. As always, I use a physics triangle because it means that I only have to learn one thing rather than three. So my physics triangle has D at the top, S and then T. So if I want to know the speed, then I cover the S with my finger and I see that I'm left with D. The line means that you're dividing and you're dividing by T. So speed equals distance divided by time. Remember if they ask you in the exam to specify the equation linking them, whatever you do, don't draw the triangle. Draw the triangle on a rough bit of paper or on the back of your exam paper and then just use it to pull out the correct equation. You need to have it like I've drawn it on the right hand side here. You need to literally write out the words. The second really important equation is acceleration. And remember when you're accelerating, you're either getting faster or slower. That's if you're decelerating. And the units you need to provide is whatever the distance and the speed is, but you need to have it squared. So if it's metres per second, then it's metres per second squared. Look at this question now. Hannah accelerated at 2 metres per second squared for 10 seconds. By the way, those units mean the same as metres per second squared. I just couldn't find the squared symbol. Her initial speed is 2 metres per second. Find her final speed. This is quite a massive question because it's about rearranging equations, but I'm just going to substitute the numbers in straight away. So acceleration is 2. Her final speed is what we're looking for, so I'm going to write x, minus her initial speed, which I was told was 3 metres per second, and the time taken was 10. Now I need to just use basic maths and rearranging, so what am I going to do? Well, if the right-hand side is divis divided by 10, I need to get rid of the divided by 10, so how do I do that? I multiply both sides by 10, and therefore it becomes 20 equals x minus 3. Okay, we're nearly there. We just need to get rid of the 3 on the right-hand side. If x is, if you're taking away the 3 from the x, in order to get rid of it, you need to, to add it. So, to get x by itself, we get x, because we've added the 3. Then we add the 3 to the other side, so it's 23. So, actually, the final speed in this case is 23 metres per second. Right. To do with the speed time topic, I'm just going to talk you through the graphs and show you some past exam questions since that's the best way to illustrate it. So if you have a distance time graph, you're going to have distance on the y-axis. Don't forget to put the units if they, they ask you to draw a graph. You're going to have time on the x-axis. To calculate speed, remember that speed is distance divided by time. So therefore, you can find the speed from this graph by calculating the gradient of the line. If you have a speed time graph, this is slightly different. So you're going to have speed on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, but in order to find the distance travelled, remember that is the area under the graph line. To find acceleration, which is change in speed over time, this time you're going to find the gradient on the speed time graph. Now, if this is sounding confusing, I'll now show you some examples and then we'll get to grips with it that way. I've picked out some questions. So question one, a toy car rolls down a ramp and hits a cushion. The graph shows how its velocity changes with time. So this is effectively a speed time graph. Constant velocity on the graph is shown by, what does the word constant mean? Well, it means same. So where on this graph is it the same velocity? Now you can kind of imagine a y-axis and the numbers going up the y-axis. So it could be something like 0, 10, 20, 30 on the velocity front. So where does that not change? Well, it's obviously going to be the horizontal portion of the line because at that point, the speed or the velocity is going to be the same everywhere. So the answer here is B, the horizontal part of the line. And with these sorts of questions, rather than reading the options through and getting confused, I would look at the question first of all, work out what you think is the answer, and then see if that is an option below. The distance travelled is shown by, well, again, I told you to work out distance, it's the area under the graph line. Let's look at the options. And that's A. The average velocity of the toy car is given by, so remember your equation, velocity or speed equals distance divided by time, therefore that is B. A bus travels along a straight road. The graph shows how the velocity of the bus changes during a short journey. Okay, so we've got a velocity time graph, so again, distance will be given by area under the curve, acceleration will be given by the gradient. Anyway, state the velocity of the bus after 25 seconds. So you're looking up here. 
It's always good to show you're working out. Read across here. The answer here is 6 metres per second. How long is the bus stationary during its journey? Now, I've seen loads of people get this wrong because they think that it's stationary here and here. Well, no, that's absolute rubbish because look at the velocity. It's 12, so stationary means that it was standing still. So standing still means that the velocity must have been zero, which is just this chunk here. And therefore, your answer here is 10 seconds. State the equation linking acceleration, change in velocity and time taken. They're giving you the exact wording, so you want to write it out as they've written it. So you're going to write acceleration equals change in velocity over time taken, or you could have written A equals V minus U over T. Calculate the acceleration of the bus during the first 10 seconds. Give the unit that's worth three marks. So we'll have a look back up here, and we're looking at this portion of the graph. The first 10 seconds, we're looking at the gradient. So that equation was acceleration equals v minus u over t. So that is final speed, which is 12, minus initial speed, which was 0, over time taken, which was 10. So 12 take 0 over 10 is 1.2. The units of acceleration are meters per second squared. State the equation linking average speed, distance moved, and time taken. Average speed equals distance moved divided by time taken. The bus moves a total distance of 390 metres during the journey. Calculate the average speed of the bus. So, speed equals distance divided by time. Distance is 390 divided by, look on the graph for whatever the time was, and it was 60 seconds. Pop that into your calculator and your answer will be 6.5 metres per second. The bus travels further in the first 30 seconds of its journey than it does during the last 30 seconds of this journey. Explain how the graph shows this. Well, remember that I told you distance is given area by area under the graph line, and you can see that the trapezium for the first 30 seconds is way bigger than the one for the second 30 seconds, so therefore clearly the bus travelled further. So for the first mark, state the fact that distance is given by area under the graph, and then for the second mark, compare the, the two areas under the line and you're done. Figure 15 shows how the velocity of the train changes with time as the train travels along a straight section of the journey. Estimate the distance travelled by the train along the section of the journey shown in figure 15. To gain full marks you must show how you've worked out the answer. This sucks because they've given you a really horrible graph line. Because remember when you're working out distance you need to find the area under the graph. So there's loads of different ways of doing it but I'm going to do it like this. So I'm going to split this shape up into as many different rectangles and squares as I can and I'm going to work out the individual areas so that's clearly going to be 300 times 5 to give me 1500 as that area this bit here is going to be 200 times 25 on the y-axis to give me a value which is 5000 and then you can use whichever method you prefer to work out the weird shapes at the top. So I kind of divided them into two triangles, which is why for this bit up here, I did half times 200 times 5 to give me an area of 500. Then again, I turned this bit into a triangle. So here I did half times 200 times 20. That gave me 2,000. And then just add up all those individual numbers to help you get your final answer. Um, so I did 2,000 plus 500 plus 5,000 plus 1,500 to give me a value which is 9,000. Alternatively, you could have done the counting squares approach. So you could have worked out the number of squares is approximately 17 and that each square represents 500 metres, but I would never have done it that way personally. Nine, the stopping distance of a car is the sum of the thinking distance and the braking distance. Table four shows how the thinking distance and braking distance vary with speed. What is meant by the braking distance of a vehicle? Finally, a definition that you just have to learn off by heart. So that's the distance travelled under the braking force, or you could say it's the distance travelled from the moment the brake is applied to when the car comes to a stop. The data in table four refers to a car in good mechanical condition driven by an alert driver. Explain why the stopping distance of the car increases if the driver is very tired, right, if the driver is very tired, clearly they're not going to be able to respond as quickly, so their reaction time will increase, and this will therefore increase the thinking distance, and therefore, because they've told us how stopping 
thinking and breaking distance all link, therefore the stopping distance will increase too. The student looks at the data in table form and writes the following. Thinking distance is proportional to speed. Breaking distance is proportional to speed. Explain whether the student is correct. No, they're not correct because although when the speed increases, the thinking distance increases by the same factor, the breaking distance does not. And then you want to show some numbers here. So you could say, for example, that increasing from 10 metres per second to 20 metres per second increases the thinking distance from 6 metres to 12 metres but the breaking distance increases from 6 metres to 24 metres. Students suspended a spring from a laboratory stand and then hung a weight from the spring. Figure 1 shows the spring before and after the weight is added. Measure the extension of the spring shown in figure 1. So do just make sure that you're measuring the extension. So use your ruler to draw a horizontal line from here to a scale. And then you're looking for the bottom of that spring, because that's what you're comparing. So from here to here. And then measure using the ruler they've given you, and they'll accept any answer between 12 and 13 millimetres. The student used the spring, a set of weights and a ruler to investigate how the extension of the spring depended on the weight hanging from the spring. Before starting the investigation, the student wrote the following prediction. The extension of the spring will be directly proportional to the weight hanging from the spring and figure 2 shows how the student arranged the apparatus. Before taking any adjustments, the student adjusted the ruler to make it vertical. Explain why adjusting the ruler was important. That's worth two marks, so make two separate points. The most obvious point is to reduce the error in measuring the extension of the spring. And then you need to get a bit more detailed as to what the issue would be if she kept it at an angle. So the point is that if the ruler was kept at an angle, the measured extension would be shorter than the actual real result. The student measured the extension of the spring using a range of weights and the student's data is shown plotted as a graph in figure 3. What range of weight did the student use? So this is a maths term, range. So that's her top um, measurement and her lowest measurement. So she measured between 1 newtons, newtons and 6 newtons. You do get away with saying 0 and 6 newtons, but you really shouldn't say 0 because there isn't actually a measurement taken there. You can see from the graph she only measured between 1 and 6 newtons in weight. Why does the data plotted in figure 3 support the student's prediction? So let's look at the prediction again. The extension of the spring will be directly proportional to the weight hanging from the spring. So is this graph showing direct proportionality? Yes it is, the reason being because it shows a straight line which goes through the origin. Describe one technique you could use to improve the accuracy of the measurements taken by the student. That's worth two marks. So you could describe any practical technique that would improve the accuracy, such as using a ruler that has greater precision, using a set square, which will mean that you're lining your ruler up at 90 degrees appropriately. You could line up the bottom of the spring with the ruler scale. Um, and then they've talked about using a pointer, but I don't really know what a horizontal pointer is. So personally, I wouldn't use that. The mark actually says, attach a horizontal pointer to the bottom of the spring. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Um, the student continued the investigation by increasing the range of weights added to the spring. All of the data is shown plotted as a graph in figure 4. At the end of the investigation, all of the weights were removed from the spring. What can you conclude from figure 4 about the deformation of the spring? Okay, so we don't have that straight line anymore. We can see it's curved. And you need to be really technical here and talk about what's actually happened to the spring. And you're going to first of all state that the spring has been inelastically deformed. And that basically means it won't return to its original length when the weights are removed. And if you don't want to say inelastically deformed, you can get away with saying it doesn't go back to its original length. And you've got to state a reason for your conclusion. And that's because it went past its limit of proportionality. So it is worth knowing about Springs Hooke's Law. For calculating pressure, you need to know about both force and area. To have a high pressure, you're going to need a force which is applied over a small area, and to have a low pressure, you're going to need a force which is applied over a large area. So if we look at our formula triangle, we see that it contains force, area and pressure. Force goes at the top, then it goes area, then it goes pressure. It's worth learning this triangle. We have many things in everyday life which will be designed in order to either increase pressure or decrease pressure depending on their use. Something like a knife or a drawing pin, for example, they need to be sharp. So what you need to do is apply a force over a very small area to increase the pressure. And that's to make knives really sharp so you can slice through things and it's to help you stick a 
drawing pin in the wall. You'll notice that the drawing pin has a nice wide top and that increases the area, therefore decreasing the pressure and that means that the pin doesn't actually stick itself into your thumb because that wouldn't be very helpful of course. There are other applications of pressure which you need to know about and that will be applications which aimed at decreasing pressure. So things like elephant's feet and camel's feet, they don't want to be sinking into the sand so they need to be applying much lower pressure. The way they do that is by having really large feet because what these do is they spread the force, so the weight of the animal over a really large area to help decrease pressure and that will help stop the animal from sinking into the sand. Here I'm looking at a question, so which exerts more pressure on the ground, a tank with a weight of 80,000 newtons or a cyclist with a weight of 1,000 newton? The tank trucks have a contact area of 10 metres squared and each of the cyclist tyres have a contact area of 0.06 metres squared. So what you need to do is begin by drawing the triangle to help you sort out your formula. So it looks like this, forces at the top, then it goes area, and then it goes pressure. So I'm going to change to black. So I'm obviously looking at the pressure, so I need the form of the equation which looks like this, force over area. I'm going to start by looking at the tank. So its pressure will be its force, and obviously that will be the 80,000 newtons. Why? Because weight and force have the same units. So that is newtons, and therefore we can use them interchangeably. So that's 80,000 divided by the area, which I've been told is 10. And here's the answer, answer 8,000 newtons per metre squared. Now let's look at the cyclist. Okay, so the pressure will equal the force again, which is this time 1,000 newtons, divided by the area. Now don't make a mistake here. The area is two lots of 0 0.006. The reason being because obviously the cyclist has two tyres. So I'm going to do 0 0.006 times 2, which equals 1,000. Please don't let me run out of space. By 0 0.0. One two, and I'm going to use the calculator here. And the answer here is eight three three newtons meters squared. So, as you can see, it's obvious that the cyclist exerts more pressure because their pressure is eighty three thousand three hundred thirty three. So, make sure you write that the cyclist is the answer. Question 4. A diver works in the sea on a day when the atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals and the density of the seawater is 1,028 kg per m cubed. The diver uses compressed air to breathe underwater. 1,700 litres of air from the atmosphere is compressed into a 12-litre gas cylinder. The compressed air quickly cools to its original temperature. Calculate the pressure of the air in the cylinder. The only reason these questions are hard is because you need to actually pull out the information in the question, but once you've done that, it's straightforward enough. So what numbers have we been given? Well, we've been given atmospheric pressure of 101 kPa, density, which is here, but I don't think we need to use that quite yet. We've been told that 1,700 litres of air is compressed into a 12-litre gas cylinder. So we can see here straight away we've got two volumes, we've got a pressure, and we've got another pressure. So which equation contains two lots of volumes and two lots of pressures? Well, it's this one. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is given on the front of your paper, but it's quite straightforward to remember anyway. Just make sure your units are all the same and then start subbing in these numbers. So pressure 1 is going to be 101 times volume 1, which is 1,700 equals, we're looking for P2, so I'll we'll keep that there, times 12. And then the way to work this out is work at the left-hand side first of all, so 101 times 1700 and then divide both sides by 12 and then when you round that to 3 sig fig you're going to get P2 equals 1, 4, 3, 0, 0. The units will be kilopascals. State the equation linking pressure, difference, depth, density, and g. So you can write this out in words. You can literally write pressure difference equals depth times density times g. Or you can write it out as symbols, which would be P equals H times, remember it's the Greek letter rho, 
which looks like a P, so that's why it's a bit confusing, times G. So if in doubt, I would write it out in words. Whatever you do, don't write gravity for G. They're very fussy over this. You need to write acceleration due to gravity. Calculate the increase in pressure when the diver descends from the surface to a depth of 11 metres. So what you're going to do here, I'm just going to write out the equation. So pressure equals height times density rho times G. So 11 times density, which we were given right at the beginning of the question, which is 1,028 times G, which is 10, and we need to know that number. You can use 9.8 also, but 10 is easy. And then you work that out and you get an answer, which is 110 kPa. Part 3, calculate the total pressure on the diver at a depth of 11 metres. Assume that the atmospheric pressure remains 101 kPa. Well, because it's worth only one mark, they've only given you a small gap. You shouldn't be doing any proper calculations here, so no substituting into equations. You simply need to add together your previous value um, to the atmospheric pressure. So that's 101 plus 110, which equals 211 kilopascals. So the wave topic, let's try and cover as much of this as possible. There are two types of wave you need to know about, transverse and longitudinal waves. Learn the perfect definition for both. Transverse waves, vibrations occur perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is travelling. Key examples here are water waves, light waves and any member of the EM spectrum, infrared radiation, ultraviolet, x-rays, etc. Longitudinal waves, vibrations this time occur parallel to the direction in which the wave is travelling. Your key example here is a sound wave. Be prepared to draw a longitudinal wave and notice that there are periods of refraction and compression, so it's like a slinky, where it comes close together, that's compression, where it moves further apart, that's a refraction. Now the wave equation states that wave speed equals wave frequency times wavelength, wave speed measured in meters per second, frequency measured in hertz, and wavelength measured in meters. What is the frequency of the wave? Well, it's the number of waves per second. If you're labelling a wave, be prepared to draw the amplitude, which is from either the middle line to the top of the wave or to the bottom of the wave. It's not from top to bottom, that's two times the amplitude. The wavelength is the distance between two peaks or two troughs. The time period of a wave is the time taken to produce one wave and it's given by the equation frequency equals one over time period. So let's talk about reflection. That's all to do with waves bouncing. So remember the key thing here is to know the difference between the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. So the wave coming in and hitting the substance is the incident ray. It bounces off and what you find is the angle at which it bounces off. So the angle of reflection will equal the incident angle. Don't forget to label your normal line, which is a line, it's like an imaginary line drawn at 90 degrees to the boundary surface. Refraction is all about a wave changing direction when it enters a new medium and that's due to it either slowing down or speeding up, so it's due to a change in wave speed. What you find here is that if you have a light wave entering a glass block, it will slow down and it will bend towards the normal. On exiting the block, it will speed up again and bend away from the normal, so be prepared to draw that. They'll ask you to draw it for IGCSE, Edexcel and lots of different shapes, so do try and practice that before the exam. And also be aware of what happens when water waves move from a different depth. So when they go from deep water, you find that they're travelling really quickly and that the waves are very far apart from each other. As they enter shallower water, they slow down and the waves become closer together and you'll actually see the wave front getting closer together. If you're struggling to remember that, just remember cars on a the road. They'll be further apart when they're travelling nice and quickly and then when you're stuck in a traffic jam and they're travelling slowly, they're basically on top of each other. The fraction is also due to waves spreading out when they pass through a gap and you see maximum diffraction when the gap is the same size as the wavelength. Diffraction is responsible for houses in remote areas being, being able to pick up radio signals because effectively the radio waves have such long wavelengths that they diffract around the hillside and reach the aerial of the house. Microwaves and TV waves don't have such long wavelengths so they can't diffract far enough and therefore can't reach the houses. Let's quickly talk about digital and analog signals. Now digital signals can be either on or off, one of two values, zero or one, so that's your definition of digital signal. They're preferable to analog signals because you get less noise, so you get less disturbance in the transmission. Um, if they ask you the advantages of digital signals, you're also going to say that you can do multiplexing, you have wider bandwidth, 
and you can carry more information per second. This is me just giving you points off the mark scheme. It's not a really big topic, so I'm not really going to go into it here, but just make sure you've learned those facts. Remember the difference between luminous and non-luminous objects? Well, luminous objects give out light, so something like the sun or a lamp. Non-luminous objects simply reflect this light, so the moon is an example of a non-luminous object, as is a table. Now, an image that can be produced on a screen is known as a real image. One which cannot be produced on a screen is known as a virtual image. You need to know the properties of an image inside a plane mirror. Now, remember that clearly the image is going to be the same size as the original object. It's going to be laterally inverted, which means your left and right sides will have swapped over in the mirror. Go check in a mirror if you don't really understand what I'm saying. It's going to be the same colour and it's going to be the same distance behind the mirror as you're standing in front of it. Now the equation for the calculated refractive index is n equals sine i over sine r, which you'll have to learn. Now sine i, so remember i is the incident angle, so you just need to pop that into your calculator with the sine in front of it. And sine r, that's the angle of refraction, so again pop it into your calculator, but first of all pressing the sine button. Now the critical angle is something they're like asking you about, and it's all to do with the angle of incidence. So every type of medium, every type of substance has its own critical angle. Now, if the angle of incidence is less than the critical angle, you get both refraction and reflection taking place. If the angle of incidence is the same as the critical angle, you get a refraction which occurs along the boundary. If the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, you get what's called total internal reflection. So you don't get any refraction, all the light is totally internally reflected. And they make use of this in optical fibres. Now, to calculate critical angle, you simply need to do sine c equals 1 over n, making sure you inverse sine on your calculator to get the correct value for c. Dispersion is all to do with light splitting up and spreading out. So if you get white light, remember it's made up of lots of different colours. If you shine it into a prism, it will split into those colours. Remember the order of the rainbow, and that will help you with knowing what colours the light splits into. So Richard of York gave battle in vain. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Now, red is refracted the least because it slows down the least. Violet is refracted the most because it was travelling the fastest and therefore slows down the most. What is an echo? Well, it's a reflected sound wave. Remember they use echo sounding for working out the depth of the ocean, so they'll send down some sound waves. They'll record the time it takes for the sound wave to be transmitted and then be received again by the transmitter. You use the equation speed equals distance over time, so you know the speed of the sound wave. You've recorded the time, just make sure you have the time, because obviously if you use the full time, then that's the time it took to, for the wave to hit the bottom and come back up, whereas the distance is only from the transmitter to the bottom, which is why you have to halve the time. What is ultrasound? Well, ultrasound is a longitudinal sound wave, which is above the range of human hearing, so it's above 20,000 hertz. Try and be really detailed with your answers there. Infrasound is sound which is too low for the human ear to hear, so it's below 20 hertz. The last thing to do with sound waves is remember that pitch relates to the frequency of the sound wave. So the number of waves per second, the higher that number, the higher the pitch, so the squeaky of the sound, like hi, whereas amplitude, so that's the height of the wave, is all to do with the loudness of the sound. So the higher the amplitude, the louder the sound. So if we take my rubbish finger here, if I do that, can you see it has a very low amplitude? Because it's very short, so that means it's a quiet sound, but because the frequency is very high, it has a high pitch. So it's a very squeaky sound. Whereas if I were to do this, we've got a much larger amplitude, so a loud sound, but because the waves are so infrequent, it's a very low sound. The data shown in Table 3 was obtained from an investigation into the refraction of light at an air-to-glass boundary. So we've got various angle of incidence, angle of refraction. Describe an investigation a student could complete in order to obtain similar data to that given in Table 3. Your answer should consider any cause of inaccuracy in the data. A label diagram may be drawn as part of your answer. So you're trying to work out all the experimental steps that would lead you to be able to calculate angles of incidence and angle of refraction. So first of all, you need a source of light, so you're going to use a ray box. You're going to shine it onto a glass block which has been placed on the piece of paper that you've drawn around. Don't forget to add your normal, which is the line drawn 90 degrees to the glass block surface. Then we're going to do use a protractor because we need to work out our various angles. So you're going to use a 
protractor to work at an angle of 20 degrees which you're then going to use to shine the light from the ray box using and then you're going to use your protractor again to work out that angle of refraction and then obviously say repeat um, in order to increase reliability. The last marking point is you should an your answer should consider any cause of inaccuracy so you must answer that bit of the question in order to get full marks. So possible sources of inaccuracy include the width of the light ray, you need it to be nice and skinny to avoid inaccuracies um, in order to um, ensure that you're judging where the light ray is. The crucial thing about the electromagnetic spectrum is that there's no need for particles so these waves transfer energy without the need for particles and that explains why the sound waves don't actually fit the family of waves which make up the electromagnetic spectrum because they need particles. First of all you need to know that they're transverse waves and that means that the vibrations occur at right angles to the direction in which the wave is travelling. Second of all, all the electromagnetic spectrum waves travel ridiculously far and that all waves can travel in a vacuum and what's a vacuum is simply a space with no particles and what we're really talking about is space. This means that all our waves can transfer energy across space and it's for this reason, these properties, that we actually feel the heat from the sun because the infrared radiation from the sun, that is an example of an EM wave, is travelling to us across all those hundreds of thousands of miles in order to reach us on earth and support life. Right, so let's just get straight into the waves. In order to work out which end we're talking about, I'm going to start at the end which is at the highest frequency. Remember the frequency of the wave is how many waves are per second. So as a diagram you'll see the waves very, very close together. So starting at one end we have gamma rays. Now gamma rays have a very high frequency and therefore automatically that means that their wavelength is very short. Gamma rays have a variety of uses. Because they're such high frequency it means they're very dangerous. So we can use them to kill cancer cells if they're targeted at the right tissue. Or we can use them to sterilise hospital, hospital surgery equipment so that um, we don't have any bacteria left on them. So they're very useful in that way. However, if they're misused, they can obviously cause cancer. So that's certainly something to bear in mind. So the wave up from that, slightly lower frequency but not much, is x-rays. And that's a nice straightforward use. Remember, you're just going to use that to take images of people's bodies because we use x-rays to look at bones and you can see if there's any tumours or if there's any breakage. So we just use that really in hospitals to view inside the human body. Next up, we have UV rays. Again, slightly um, longer wavelength, slightly lower frequency, but not much. So we use UV. If you can't remember anything, just remember you use them in tanning beds because it's ultraviolet radiation. It depends on your exam book, but you might also state that they're used for detecting counterfeit notes or you can use them in fluorescent tubes. Okay, then we move up again and we're at visible light and that's just the light that we use to see in everyday life. So we'll obviously use that to create images which our eyes can see, it's also used in photography. Then moving on up again we've got infrared radiation. Now infrared has a variety of uses. We use that when you're using your remote control to turn on the TV or your radio. And you can also use infrared for cooking because infrared radiation is emitted by any hot object so you'll find that inside your regular oven. Oh hi cat! How did you enjoy your food? She's been licking a yogurt pot. So then moving on up again we've got microwaves. So we're getting to the point where we've got quite low frequency waves here and we've got a very long wavelength and microwaves are used for cooking. As you would expect microwaves cook and they cook much faster than infrared waves. Now microwaves can also be used in satellite communication, so there's a second use if you're asked by the exam. And finally, we're going to talk about radio waves. Obviously radio waves are used in communication because that's how we listen to the radio. These are our longest wavelength waves and they have the lowest frequency out of all the waves in the EM spectrum. Let's just quickly talk about light and colour. This is kind of to do with filters. Now, in terms of the colour we see, it's all based on what sort of light is shone at a material and what colour the material is. 
So let's just talk about white light first of all. Remember white light isn't actually white, it's made up of seven colours which together form the colour white. So that's your Richard of York gave battle in vain, um, red, orange, yellow, etc, etc. So if white light is shone on a white object, the object will appear white because it reflects all those colours. Now, if a white light is shone on a red object, what happens is all the other colours which aren't red are absorbed by the object and only red is reflected, which is why the object looks red. So in terms of the colour we see, it's all to do with the sort of colour that's reflected. The same when, when a white light is shone on a blue object, all other colours are absorbed, blue is reflected. Now there are three primary colours in physics. Those are red, green and blue, so very different from anything you've done in art. You might have heard before, black isn't actually a colour, and that's because black is seen when all colours are absorbed and none are reflected. So if you shine white on a black object, then all the colours of the spectrum of the rainbow will be absorbed, none will be reflected, so the object will appear black. Let's take a tr slightly trickier example. So let's say we have a red book and we look at it in blue light. Now because blue is shining on a red book, there's no red in that blue light because it's just blue. So what happens is the blue is absorbed, no colours are reflected, so the red book will appear black in blue light. Let's take another example. So we've got a green hat and we're looking at it in red light. So we're shining red onto the green hat. Now because there's no green in that red light, the red will be absorbed, the green won't be reflected and therefore again it will appear black. Let's quickly look at the difference between transparent and translucent. Well, translucent objects allow a lot of the light through, but not all of it, and that light is scattered and refracted, so you get a blurred image. A transparent object allows all the light through with no scattering or refracting. I was really struggling to work out how to teach you this, but I think if I go through the definitions you need to know, kind of explain how lenses actually work, give you some instructions on how to draw lens diagrams and then we'll go through them together, some past exam questions so you can actually see how they're constructed. Anyway, so let's look at the following first of all. First of all, what is a convex lens? Well, a convex lens is otherwise known as a converging lens and if you know what the word converging means, it is actually just a normal English word, it means coming together. So if you've got a couple of rays and they pass through a convex or converging lens, then they'll be brought together and they'll meet behind the lens. An example of use of this is the magnifying glass. A concave lens is a diverging lens, and diverging means spreading out. So if you have rays which pass through a diver diverging lens, they'll spread out so they'll never actually meet on the other side of the lens, and we can use those in glasses to correct short-sightedness. Now the focal length is the distance between the centre of the lens and its point of focus. The principal focus is the point where the parallel rays meet after they pass through the lens. And then lastly, the difference between a real image and a virtual image is that a real image can be formed on a screen and a virtual image cannot. Now, if I move on and I show you this, hopefully this will make it a bit clearer. So with the convex lens, we can see that when the parallel rays pass through it, they then come together, i.e. they converge. And the point where they converge behind the lens is called the focal point. And that's what's going on here. They're meeting. Whereas with a concave lens, we call this a diverging lens, because what happens is these rays come to the lens, but rather than coming together, they spread out, just like this. And so therefore the focal point, well, what, that's where the parallel rays meet, so that's going to be in front of the lens as opposed to behind. Just to explain some of these lenses and their uses, so here we can see someone that's got the same sort of eye issue that I have. It's a short-sighted person. The reason being that normally rays should meet here, they should meet on the retina, which is back here because that's where the photoreceptors are, but we can see that they're converging far too early. So that could be because the eyeball's too long or the lens is too strong. So one way or another we need to cause those rays to spread out a bit. That's where a concave or diverging lens comes in because they, this lens causes the rays to spread out a little bit here so that when they finally hit the lens and the lens brings them back into focus, it'll bring the focal point onto the retina so the person can see more clearly. Thank God these glasses exist, otherwise I literally wouldn't see a thing. If we move on and we look at someone that's long-sighted, so this is what happens to older people. They start needing glasses to read print like reading books or whatever so 
this time you've got the parallel rays coming in. They're hitting the lens, but the lens is weakened over time. So rather than meeting on the retina here, they're meeting behind the eyeball, behind the retina. So you're going to get a very blurred image here. So instead, you need a convex or converging lens, which is actually going to cause those rays to come in, so that when they're brought onto the human lens, they meet nicely on the back of the eyeball here on the retina. I just want to run through the instructions for how to draw the lens diagrams. Um, it will look a bit confusing here until I go through some examples shortly, but I just wanted them all written down so you've actually got some instructions to follow. So first of all, remember that the object, they'll give you that as a little arrow, and then in order to begin your lens diagram, you want to draw a horizontal line from the top of that object arrow to where it hits the lens. Now, depending on when you've, whether you've been given a convex or concave lens, if you've been given a convex lens, then you then want to take a straight line from where it's hit the lens down through the focal point, which will be behind the lens in the case of a convex lens. If you've been given a concave lens, what you're going to do is take the line in front of the lens and through the focal point there. Like I said, it will become clear shortly. The next line is much easier to draw because you're just drawing a diagonal line which runs straight from the top of the object arrow through the middle of the lens. Now, at this point, you should have lines that cross, and where those lines cross, that will be where your image is formed. And you're going to draw a little arrow showing the image, and then based on whether the image is above this horizontal central line or below, that will tell you if your image is upright or inverted. You're going to compare the length of that arrow with the object arrow to tell you if the image is bigger or smaller. We like to say here enlarged or diminished to sound nice and fancy. And then if the image is formed behind the lens, so to the right hand side we know that the image is real and if it's formed in front of the lens then we know that it is virtual. So let's have a go at constructing various ray diagrams. This arrow here is supposed to be the object, this is the lens and these are the focal points. So based on my instructions, first of all you want to draw a horizontal line from the top of the object, use a ruler and a pencil for this, and then you want to take it through the focal point like that. Oh gosh, I really struggle on the iPad. Next step, you want to draw a diagonal line which runs from the top of the object arrow through the middle of the lens and we'll see where it crosses. Oh, not very good, not very good. Oh, it's supposed to cross through the middle of the lens and then where the two lines cross, that is your image and then you need to compare it to the original object. Now, because it's underneath the line, we know that the image is inverted. If I draw it accurately, the actual height of the arrow, so from here to here, compared with that, believe it or not, would have been shorter, so therefore we know that the image formed is smaller, or we could write diminished, if you're feeling fancy, because that means smaller. And then because it's formed after the lens, then we know our image is real. If they ask you for an example of a lens which works like this, then you can talk about the eye or a camera or something like that. This time our object arrow has moved in a little bit so it should affect the image formed. So again we're going to draw from the top of the object arrow, nice horizontal line, to meet the lens and then make it go through that focal point. Next up we're adding a diagonal line straight through like that. Add arrows, I think I forgot to add arrows on the other one to show the direction that the rays are going. And then where they cross, that's where our image is formed. Again it's below the line so we know that it's inverted. I've drawn this one a bit better, so it's bigger than the original arrow here. So this is much larger than this, which means that we have a larger image formed. So I'm going to write enlarged. And because it's formed after the lens again, it's real. And an example of this is a projector. This one's slightly different. We can see that the object arrow is now moved between the focal point and the lens. So we're going to see a slightly different thing happening, but it doesn't matter. You can still use the same process horizontal line to the lens. Then we're going to take the line down through that focal point and then from here on this is why it's a bit confusing because if I then draw the diagonal line here you can see those rays are never ever going to meet on the right hand side ever. They're just going to keep going and going and going. So what you want to do is take a your ruler and carry on the lines and make them dotted. Make it nice and straight unlike what I'm doing. Do the same here, and then eventually they'll cross, and that's actually where your image will be formed, up here. So I'm going to draw the arrow 
So now let's discuss what we can see. Well, because it's the same, not the same height, but it's upright, it's the same direction as the object arrow was facing, we know that it's upright. Because the arrow is much larger, we know that it's enlarged. But because it's formed before the lens, we know it must be a virtual image. And an example of this would be the magnifying glass. And your arrows will go this way. Now this time, it's much, much harder than the previous examples. So, first of all, you're going to draw your horizontal line, like I said, here. Then we're going to leave it and we're going to draw the diagonal line, as always, here. However, the difference is this time that because it's the convex lens and the image will therefore be formed before the lens, you're therefore going to take a line from the focal point in front of the lens there. And that's how you're going to draw it. Now, where those lines cross here is where your image will be formed. It's the same direction, the image arrow, as the object arrow, so we know it's upright. We can see it's much shorter, so therefore it's going to be smaller or diminished. And because it's formed in front of the lens, we know we have a virtual image. That one's hard, but remember, it's kind of similar. We've drawn the horizontal line, but rather than taking it down here, we're taking it through here, and the diagonal line here stays the same. So I'm now going to show you an exam question or two to try and help you see what's going on a bit better. 7a. Some people have an eye defect called long sight. State one cause of long sight. Remember that's what I said happens to older people when they struggle to read books and things. And I said it's because their rays aren't converging properly on the retina. And what's happening here is that they're converging behind the retina. So clearly two things could be at fault here. Either the eyeball is too short or, as in the case of most older people, it's because their lens isn't focusing properly because it's lost some of its strength. So you could write here, the eyeball is too short or the lens is too weak. Part 2. Long sight can be corrected by surgery. During surgery, the surgeon may need to cut and heat very delicate parts of the eye. That sounds horrendous. Name the piece of equipment which provides the energy source needed to do this. Remember, it's called laser eye surgery. So we need a laser here. I don't want to do 7B. I don't think it's helpful. 7c. An object O is very near to a convex lens as shown in figure 15. Complete figure 15 to show how the rays of light from the object form an image. So the crucial thing here is it's this sort of, it's this sort of lens here. So remember that it's a nice straightforward one, which means we're going to take the first line here, the horizontal line, to the lens, and we're going to make it go through that focal point down there. Next up, we're drawing the diagonal line, which passes down here and clearly those lines are never going to cross so we're going to use our ruler to trace back those lines up here and then they'll cross and that's where your image will be formed draw the arrow showing the image and it's there and if I actually scroll down I can see that the next question would be describe the image formed so what can we see we can see that that arrow is much larger than the original object arrow so we know that the image is enlarged. It's facing the same direction, which means it's upright. But because it's in front of the lens, we know that it's a virtual image. 4C, figure 7 shows light rays travelling into a human eye. Give the name of the defect shown in figure 7. So we've got our light rays coming in. And they're not meeting on the retina, are they? They're meeting far too early, which tells us that this person is short-sighted and that this lens is working too well or that the eyeball is too long. Because imagine if you sheared it off here, then the eyeball would be much shorter. So we know that part of the problem is the eyeball is too long. So give the name of the defect of vision shown in figure 7. Well, that's short-sightedness, or if you're feeling fancy, you could write myopia. 4C part 2, a concave lens can be used to correct the defect of vision shown. Complete the ray diagram in figure 8 to show how the concave lens produces an image. Use an image to represent the image. Whew, this is when it starts getting hard. So we see we've got a totally different type of lens here. So, never mind, we can do this. We're going to start by drawing the horizontal line here. But because we've got a totally different type of lens, we are not going to take it down here. No, 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 no. Instead, we're going to do a dotted line down here to this focal point. Next up, we're going to draw the nice diagonal line, which is, as we know, nice and easy to do. So that's going to come down here. 
and then we can see where those lines have crossed it's here so that's our image because it's facing the same direction as the object so here and here we know that it's upright it's much shorter than the original object arrow so we know it's diminished or smaller and it's formed in front of the lens which means it's a virtual image Let's start by looking at which metals are magnetic. Now there aren't very many of them. There's iron and then steel, which contains iron and carbon. There's nickel and there's cobalt. Now the two we're mostly interested in are iron and steel and that's because we can divide them into a softly magnetic material and a hard magnetic material. A hard magnetic material is something which doesn't lose its magnetism very easily and our example for this is steel. However, iron is kind of much more helpful because you can actually turn on its magnetism and then it loses it pretty much straight away. So we call that a soft magnetic material and it's good for use in big magnets, for example in scrapyards when you're moving cars around. You don't want a magnet which maintains its magnetism all the time because you just have the car stuck to the crane but if you can turn it on and off, you can lift up your car, move it, and then drop it again. So that's obviously really straightforward. Now, what do magnetic field lines show you? Well, first of all, they show you the shape of the magnetic field. Second of all, they tell you the direction of the magnetic field, which runs from north to the south pole. And then finally, they tell you how strong the magnetic field is, because the closer together those magnetic field lines are, the stronger the magnet. Now, a magnet is obviously something which attracts other things, and we can use those in everyday settings, but we're really interested when we're talking about this topic in electromagnets. So all you need is a current flowing through a wire and you create a magnetic field around the wire. And that's really the simplest form of electromagnet. And it is a very special scientific phenomenon. The fact that just by simply causing a current to flow along a wire will create an electromagnet and a magnetic field. So that's pretty special. There's always questions in exams in terms of how can you increase the strength of the magnetic field, how can you increase the strength of the electromagnet, and in this case, by turning that wire into a coil, otherwise known as a solenoid, you can increase the strength, um, so therefore adding more turns of coil, that will obviously increase the strength in the magnetic field even further. If you add a soft iron core to the middle, so you just thread that through the coil, then that will increase the strength, and obviously if you increase the current, you'll increase the strength of the magnetic field. Come say hi. She's feeling very, very sociable today, aren't you? Been asleep all morning. Oh, sit there. Now I'm going to talk about something a bit more complicated, which is to do with the motor. Remember, the motor is simply something which spins, and you'll use simple examples in the classroom, and you'll use them in order to turn something. So a motor is something which spins. And we use electromagnetism when creating our motors. And this is where I'm going to introduce Fleming's left hand rule. Please don't panic about this, people hate it. But it is quite straightforward if only you know how. First of all, it's the left hand, and you need to get your thumb, first finger, and second finger in different planes to each other. Can you see that? They're all at right angles to each other. Now, the first thing you need to know is that the thumb indicates motion. So in this situation, the motion is going up. Now, the first finger first finger magnetic field and people try and remember that by saying first finger field and then finally second finger current second current that's how people try to remember it and that will be showing the direction that the current will be flowing around the circuit so some questions will ask you the direction in which the coil will turn based on the direction of the magnetic field and the current so the way to do that is to line up your magnetic field and your current with the diagram so make sure that your magnetic field is going north to south based on the magnets and that your second finger is following the direction of the current which will be indicated on the diagram around the circuit and then when you have those two lined up you'll be able to work out which way the coil will be moving and that will it will be upwards if you can line it up this way but sometimes you need to turn it around and it will be going downwards but just make sure those fingers are lined up with the arrows on the diagram and I promise you can't go wrong and your answer will be something like the coil moves up, the coil moves down now what's the role of the commutator? As the coil's moving, what would happen if they didn't exist is that the coil would move up and stay in position and the other side of the coil would move down and it would just shake and it wouldn't turn continuously. So they switch the current every half turn and that just ensures that the coil keeps rotating continuously. 
Then you have two brushes, and all they do is they main if they're if you're asked in the exam, they maintain contact between the electric circuit and the coil of wire. So the deal with this left hand rule is it's a bit like a physics triangle, formula triangle, which is if, if you have two of the components and you make the third component. So in a motor you have both the magnetic field and you have a current, so together they they produce motion, which is the turning of the motor. Now you might have to draw a simple simple diagram of electric motor and I'll try and draw one to show you for the exam. Um, the crucial thing is though that these are simple motors used in the classroom. In a practical environment you might need to add some details in terms of the fact that the magnets are replaced by electromagnets, the wire is turned into lots of coils and they sometimes add a soft iron core. So there's a bit of exam technique for you. Right, so we just said that if you have magnetic field and current, you create motion. But what about if you have the magnetic field and you have motion? Well, based on a physics triangle type of thing, then that means you create current. And that, therefore, is our introduction to generators. Because a generator is something which creates electricity. What is electricity? It's a flow of electrons. It's a current flowing. So therefore, if we have motion and we have magnetic field, we can create current. Now, in this situation, you use Fleming's right-hand rule because you'll find that your hands will, won't line up properly if you use your left hand. But again, the thumb indicates motion, first finger magnetic field, second finger current. So if you move a wire at right angles to a magnetic field, then a voltage is induced and therefore current flows. And this phenomenon is known as electromagnetic induction. We can increase the size of the electromagnetic force by moving the wire more quickly using a stronger magnet and wrapping the wire into a coil. So very similar to all our other ways of increasing things. Now, we've said that a generator creates current. We can use this in everyday in things like a bicycle dynamo. Now all that means is when you pedal, you can create electricity in order to power your light. So as you pedal, you turn the magnets and then magnetic field lines cut through a coil and this induces a current and the current is used to power the lights. So that's a really good everyday use of generators. Now, what is an alternator? An alternator is something which produces alternating current. And all an alternating current is, is current which flows first in one direction, then in another direction. The frequency of an alternating current is the number of complete cycles which are made per second. Question 9. Diagram 1 shows some of the apparatus used to investigate the force on a current carrying wire XY in a magnetic field. Diagram 2 shows the poles of the magnet viewed above. Draw the uniform magnetic field between the poles. Okay, this isn't as hard as it might sound. You just need to draw straight lines, so use a ruler. I'm not using a ruler because I'm using the iPad. And you need to do a minimum of three, and then obviously the magnetic field goes from north to south, so add arrows showing that, and that is more than enough. The current carrying wire XY is at right angles to the magnetic field. The current in the wire is 10 amps. Suggest why the wire used in this investigation must be thick. Any sensible suggestion, so otherwise a large heat might cause it to melt if it was too thin, or you could say a thicker wire is used to reduce the resistance, or you could say that it doesn't, so that it doesn't sag or bend. Explain why the wire XY experiences a force when there's a current in the circuit. So have another look here. This is quite hard, but just say that the magnetic field of the wire interacts with the magnetic field of the two magnets and you actually get a mark for just mentioning Le Fleming's left hand rule. These questions are strange with electromagnets, just kind of write down everything you know even if you're worried about whether it actually fits the context of the question. State two ways in which this force may be reduced. Okay, you could reduce the current or you could use less powerful magnets. The photographs show how an electric toothbrush fits on its charger. The charger and the toothbrush each have a coil of wire inside them. The diagram shows how the two coils are linked by a U-shaped core. This arrangement of core and coil acts as a transformer that reduces voltage. Name the type of transformer that reduces voltage. Well, that would be a step-down transformer. Explain why the core is made of a soft magnetic material such as iron. Remember, it's because iron is softly magnetising and therefore it loses its mag magnetism easily and also you need to state the fact that the magnetic field in the core can change. State the equation linking the input primary and output secondary voltages and the turns ratio of a transformer. This is something you're just going to have to learn. So write input voltage divided by output voltage equals primary turns divided by secondary turns. Please just learn that off by heart. 
The transformer has 520 primary turns and 30 secondary turns. The input voltage to the transformer is 44 volts. Calculate the output voltage. So let's just substitute those numbers in. So that calculation will look like this. The input voltage is 44. We're looking at the output, so I'm going to put X here. Primary turns is 520. Secondary is 30. It's up to you what maths you want to use to do this. What I tend to do is flip the whole lot so it becomes x over 44 equals 30 over 520. And then all you need to do is use your calculator to do 30 divided by 520 and then times it by 44 to get x by itself. And x will equal 2.5 volts. The diagram shows parts of a transformer. The input voltage to the transformer is 230 volts. The output is 25. There are 100 turns. On the secondary coil, name the type of transformer shown in the diagram. Well, it's a step down because the output voltage is lower, so write step down there. State the equation linking input, primary voltage, output, secondary voltage, primary turns, and secondary turns. We really need to learn all these equations. So this is what the equation is. Remember that it's input primary voltage over output, which is secondary voltage, equals number of primary turns divided by secondary turns. So now we're calculating the number of turns on the primary coil, so I'm going to be using that equation. And x is therefore np here. And then let's substitute what we know. We know that there are 100 turns on the secondary coil. Oh my gosh, the gardeners are so noisy. And then on the output of the transformer, we've got 25 volts, so that's voltage on the secondary and then if you scroll up, you'll see that the input voltage in the primary side is 230, and now you need to solve that for x. So just do 230 divided by 25 times it by 100, and you'll have 920 turns. B. Explain how transformer works. In your answer, you should include the reasons for using two coils, the iron core, and alternating supply. Don't stress too much if you're like, oh, I don't know how to crowbar those things into my answer, just write what you would write normally and you'll find that they'll just fit in. So first of all, say that transformer either steps up or steps down the voltage. Say that the current in the primary coil produces a magnetic field. For the third mark, say that this current is changing, which causes a changing magnetic field in the core. You need to say that the core strengthens the magnetic field. Then state that the field lines interact with the secondary coil and that this induces a voltage in the secondary coil. Um, if you think I said that quite fast, just rewind this video and listen again. But you do need to learn all the steps. It's a nightmare, and I hate magnets too. You're not alone. But it is worth learning this for five marks. 4.2. Figure 11 shows the ignition circuit used to switch the starter motor in a car on. The circuit includes an electromagnetic switch. Explain how the ignition circuit works. Four marks. Don't learn these answers off by heart, guys. You need to look at where the switch is and then work out what's going on from there. So we can see the switch at the top. Once that's closed, then it causes the circuit to be complete so the current flows. This will flow to the electromagnet, causing it to become magnetised. And then what happens there is the iron arm will be attracted as you can see, because remember, iron is a magnetic material. And then because of the fact the iron arm is attracted, it pushes the contacts together, meaning that the starter motor circuit is now complete, and then a current flows through the starter motor, causing it to turn. So you're just talking through all the steps that you can see on the diagram. So at the start of the universe, there were massive clouds of gas and dust, and they got pulled together by the force of gravity. At that point, they, the clouds became so dense that it got super hot, and it was hot enough to allow the hydrogen there to fuse with other hydrogen nuclei, and that's what we call nuclear fusion, and it's what generates a huge amount of energy, and it is the fuel, in fact, that our stars run on. So let's talk about what happens then. For both stars, big and small, they then enter the main sequence part of their lives, and what that means is that the forces within them are balanced. So the force of gravity is balanced with the outward force that is produced by the nuclear fusion. Then, at the end of that main sequence, they run out of hydrogen and something different happens depending on if you're talking about a small star or a large star. So let's start with the small star. Because it's run out of hydrogen nuclei, it can only run on things like helium. And at that point, the star cools and it swells up to become a red giant. And at this point, elements which are lighter than iron are formed. However, it's going to run out of those helium nuclei eventually, and at that point it shrinks, becomes a bit hotter, and becomes a white dwarf. When it eventually runs out of all its different types of fuels, it will become a black dwarf, and that's the end. So remember, it goes main sequence, it becomes a red giant, 
then it becomes a white dwarf and eventually it becomes a black dwarf and that's the end of it, kaput, small star, done. Let's take much larger stars now. So they enter the main sequence again, where their forces are balanced and they're carrying out nuclear fusion. However, when they run out of hydrogen, what happens is they swell up massively to become a red supergiant rather than a red giant. And at that point, an enormous explosion occurs called a supernova, and elements which are heavier than iron are formed in a supernova. Then, depending on the mass of the star, if it's still a very big star, but not super huge, it will become a neutron star, and that's just a star that's made entirely out of neutrons. However, if it was a super massive star originally, it will become a black hole, which terrifies me because effectively black holes are so strong that they don't allow, they have such a strong gravitational um, strength that they don't allow anything to escape. So everything, including light, is sucked into them, which kind of freaks me out, and I don't really like to think about it too much. In 1929, the astronomer Edward Hubble observed that the light from galaxies moving away from the Earth had longer wavelengths than expected. What name was given to this effect? Yeah, you need to just know that when the galaxies move away, it means that light's effectively stretched, which means its wavelength gets longer, and we call that red shift. From his observations, Hubble was able to calculate the speed of a galaxy and the distance of the galaxy from the Earth. Figure 5 shows the results of Hubble's calculations. What relationship between the speed of galaxy and the distance is suggested by Hubble's results. So have a good look at the graph and try and work out what's going on. So we can see a positive correlation, which means that as the distance increases, the speed of the galaxy increases. The observations made by Hubble support the idea that the universe is expanding. This means that galaxies are continually moving away from each other and from the Earth. Figure 6 shows a student using a balloon to model the idea of an expanding universe. Some dots which represent galaxies were marked on the balloon. The balloon was then inflated. Give one strength and one weakness of this model in representing the idea of an expanding universe. This is quite a nice question. So clearly when you blow into the balloon, it gets bigger, which is supposed to be a representation of the universe expanding. Because of the way the balloon stretches, it does mean that those dots will move further apart. And that agrees with the fact that the galaxies are continually moving away from each other. So that's the strength. I probably gabbled that a bit. Just say as the balloon expands, the dots get further apart, representing the galaxies. The weakness, because the dots are only on the surface balloon, whereas remember with the universe, you're going to kind of get stars everywhere. So you need to say that the dots are only on the surface of the balloon, whereas the galaxies are throughout the universe. Another weakness you could have put is that there is a limit to how far the balloon can expand, because clearly if you blow it too much, it will pop. In the 1950s, there were two main theories to explain how the universe began. Figure 1. The universe has always existed. It is continually expanding. New galaxies are formed as older galaxies die out. Theory 2. The universe began from a very small region that was extremely hot and dense. The universe has been expanding ever since. In what way do the observations made by Hubble support both Theory 1 and 2? Well, the fact that we um, say with Theory 1 and 2 that the universe is expanding, so you're going to say both theories suggest that the universe is expanding. Most scientists now believe that Theory 2 is correct. Suggests what is likely to have caused scientists to start thinking that Theory 1 is wrong. It's all to do with evidence. So remember CMBR, that's Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. That's widespread throughout the universe. And that kind of gives the suggestion that at one point it started very close together and then spread out as the universe expanded. So you can literally write here new evidence, such as CMBR. Although you can get away with just saying new evidence. So we're going to start by looking at circular motion. So any object that moves in a circle has circular motion, whether that's a car driving around a racetrack, whether it's a satellite orbiting the Earth, these both have circular motion. Now, in this topic, we need to assume that they're travelling at a constant speed. However, it's now important that you understand the difference between speed and velocity because people use them interchangeably, but they're not quite the same thing. Speed is how fast you're travelling, and you can attach a unit to it, such as 5 miles an hour, 10 metres per second, that sort of thing. Now, velocity is a vector quantity, whereas speed is a scalar quantity. And all that means is that velocity has both a size, so yes, you could be travelling at 5 metres per second, 10 miles an hour. However, because it's a vector quantity, it also has a direction, and that's what makes velocity different to speed. They both have a size. 10 meters per second, but velocity has that added thing, which is that it has a direction. So 
now we talk about an object moving in a circle and because it, although it's travelling at constant speed that object is constantly going to be changing direction and therefore it has a changing velocity and the point is the object's velocity is directed at a tangent towards the circle that sounds horrible for maths hopefully you know that a tangent is just a line that touches the edge of a circle but just goes off at an angle and therefore an object moving around a circle the fact that it's constantly changing direction the point is it will constantly change direction so that its velocity is aimed at a tangent. If that is horrible, ignore what I'm saying. I'm yet to see a question that mentions tangents. Just know that an object travelling at constant speed constantly changes its velocity. Now we need to touch on a separate point, which is that the object's travelling at constant speed is also accelerating and that's like, what is she saying? Ah, that's so stressful. How can it be travelling at constant speed but also accelerating? Because acceleration to me means speeding up. No, we need to look at the technicalities of what the word acceleration actually means. Now, acceleration is given by the equation which is change in velocity over time taken. And like I've just said, although you can be travelling at constant speed, the velocity changes because you're constantly changing direction. Therefore, in acceleration, if you're constantly changing your velocity, you're changing your direction, therefore you must be accelerating. So that is another point they may ask you. An object travelling at a constant speed is accelerating. Let's move on now. Any object that's travelling in a circle must be acted upon by resultant force. The reason why is because otherwise that object would just fly off in any direction. But we know that that object's just going to keep moving round and round and round, so it must be being acted upon by a force which is keeping it moving in a circle. And we call that the resultant force, and because it's moving in a circle, we call it the centripetal force. Now, this is a question that commonly comes up. It's going to, the question may ask, what three things affect the size of the resultant force or the centripetal force? So obviously, first of all, the mass of the object is going to have a big role to play, because the larger the object, the greater the force needed to keep it moving. Second of all, the speed or its velocity, the velocity of the object, is going to impact on the size of the force needed to keep it in that place. Because the faster it's travelling, the greater its velocity, the larger the force needed to keep it moving in a circle. And lastly, the radius, so remember that is the distance from the centre of the circle to the edge, the size of that radius is going to impact the, the size of that force because obviously if the circle's bigger, it's going to need a smaller force to keep it moving. If that's sounding complicated, don't worry too much about whether it's bigger or smaller, just learn the three things which affect the resultant force, and that is the velocity of the object, the mass of the object, and the radius of the circle. And it doesn't matter if it's a car driving along a track, or if it's a satellite orbiting a planet, these things all have a role to play. Now sometimes they ask you about the force which is acting on the object, causing it to move in the circular motion. So if it was a car travelling on a track, then that's going to be friction between the tyres and the um, road surface. If you're talking about a satellite orbiting a planet, then the force keeping it in that circular motion is going to be gravity.